Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. This is Understanding Drupal at Balkan 2019. My name is Mauricio Dinarte. You can find me as Dinarcon on Drupal.org, Twitter, pretty much anywhere. That's my email in case you want to contact me afterwards. I am from Nicaragua, beautiful country, much warmer than here. So if you ever need to escape the cold, feel free to visit. Uh, we do crazy things like going to watch lava from the border of a crater. So if you want to try it, we're welcome. Otherwise, you can go to that website and pretty much experience the same thing from, from your screen. I, I work with Agaric. We are a distributed company. I'm working from anywhere. I am in Nicaragua. We've had people in other places. And I also very I am also very passionate about teaching. So uh, I have this project called Understand Drupal, where some of the material that we're going uh, to cover today is already there, and some of it uh, is going to be there soon. Like the full session is going to be in text format in that website in both, uh, well, actually three languages: English, Spanish, and French. And eventually, I'm going to produce a video series about the same topic. So what we're going today. Everything is going to be in text and video format at some point on this website. This is an outline of what we're going to cover today. The basic idea of the session is uh, understanding what are the basic concepts in Drupal, the building blocks, so that you can understand um, how to interact with the website. If I want to make any change, where do I need to go to? Uh, in general, and this is not specific to Drupal, a website is a collection of web pages like your front page, the about page, the team page, services, articles, contacts, and so on. And when you look at one specific page, you might un identify many components. The sidebars, the footer, the header, the main content in the, in the, in the center, the, the logo, and so on. The idea and the goal of the session is to, whatever uh, understanding that you have already about using websites in general, to translate that to Drupal. So at the end, oh, this is a blog, this is a node, this is a page, this is a field, and so on. So you will be able to identify the different pieces. So uh, why would you want to use Drupal? Drupal is used by many uh, big uh, websites and organizations. The White House was for many years on Drupal. It's no longer there, but it, it's just an example of one of many governments that have ad adopted Drupal. In fact, Australia and Germany have, you know, for any government site, they have a standardized on Drupal. So, you know, that's an example. Weather.com is the biggest Drupal site. It receives more than one billion uh, visits per month. So, whether you need high security for your government or uh, high scalability for your website, you know, Drupal can manage that. The Grammys, it's also on Drupal, but the interesting part about this is that the night of the event, there is a lot of multimedia streaming uh, at the same time, you know, video, audio, text interviews, and so on. So if you need to manage multimedia in Drupal, this is a good option. Naranja Tradicional de Gandia, this is a small uh, website in Spain, and they sell three, six products, oranges, tangerines, sweets, uh, honey, marmalade, and lemons. So it is true that you can use Drupal to power, you know, big, big websites, but you can use it for your own uh, small business if you want, or your own side project if you want. So they use it in particularly to sell online, like an e-commerce solution. Uh, Tesla Motors is also built on Drupal. Uh, we haven't get to the cars yet, but sometime, uh, maybe. So far, we are on the website. So some of the features that make Drupal appealing is the high security that it has and a dedicated team that ensures that any time that a vulnerability is discovered, you will get support and a patch uh, for that. It supports multilingual, by default, online transactions, high demand of traffic. It is responsive by default. And with the help of extra modules, you can get more support and uh, media management, as I said before. So what is Drupal? Depending on who you ask, you might get different answers. But as today, we're going to focus on the CMS part of Drupal. As a CMS, multiple people can participate in the creation of content. Um, it is possible to establish publication workflows. Let's say that you work in a newspaper. So the journalist uh, 
is able to create an article, but it cannot be published right away. It needs to go through a review process. So this person only has permission to create uh, articles. Then comes an editor who is not allowed to create, but it edit what any so somebody else already created. So they can you know correct punctuations, make suggestions. You know they they can only edit. But let's say that for this example, they need the approval of the department chief for the article to go live. The department chief cannot create or edit anything. They only should, you know, tick the box to say, yes, this is going live. So three different uh, people participating in, in the publication of one article, all of them with different set of permissions. So this is possible with Drupal. You can also have content revisioning. This is the Drupal way of saying, keeping track of any and every change on the website. If you change one letter, if you add an image, if you do something on the website, Drupal will automatically keep track of that, and this comes enabled out of the box, so you don't, you don't have to do anything special. What this allows you to do is that if something goes live, either by mistake or on, on purpose, but shouldn't be there, you can track who did the change and when, by t uh, time and, and day, and you can also revert to a previous version of the same content. So you go back, you know who did the change, and depending on if, if it was malintentioned or not, you can block that person access to the website so they cannot do that anymore. Um, you can also have granular access control over each piece of content. Let's say that for this uh, event, BATCAM, we have one node, uh, one piece of content for every session that describes the session. And let's say that for the organizers, it is important to know how many people attended each session. That information can be stored as part of the content, but that is not something that we, as a general you know, public or attendees of the, of the event, need to know. So you can have pieces of content storing more data than which, what you show to the public. So that's also possible. You can decide who sees what, depending on different roles, permissions, and criteria. So this is what we're going to focus today. But Drupal is also a framework. So if you f need to integrate with a third-party API or with your own custom built C uh, CRM or something, like you need to communicate with a mobile application, something that Drupal was not uh, initially intended for, you can, ex uh, you can program uh, PHP for the most part and extend Drupal beyond its pre-built uh, functionality. For example, e-commerce was not the core of Drupal, but some people decided that you know Drupal did 80% of what I needed. I'm going to program the e-commerce integration now, and now you can use Drupal with e-commerce. You can also use it for as a repository of content of information for your mobile or backend application, and that's also a use case uh, of using Drupal as a framework. Drupal is also a community, many countries, many languages, many people. Uh, participating in, in making Drupal better. And the fact that we are here is you know, a testament of how big and, and powerful the Drupal community is. So let's have a look at some basic concepts. Um, core, what is Drupal Core? Drupal Core is the minimum required software to start a Drupal project. If you don't have Drupal Core, it is not a Drupal. It can be WordPress, it can be Django, it can be Rails, it can be something else. So you need Drupal Core. Drupal Core contains modules and themes, and we're going to see what they are in a moment. And it serves the foundation, like the base framework on which you can build on. Modules add functionality to your website, and themes control the appearance. For example, if every time that you create an article, you want that something appears on your Facebook page, or you want a Twitter to be sent automatically, that is functionality. So that will be the responsibility of a module. On the other hand, is on the, in the website, if you want to change the layout, if you want to change the fonts that are being used, if you want to change the colors, that is appearance. So that's the responsibility of the thing. Other systems blend those things together, but in Drupal there is a, a, a clear separation, or at least we try to have a clear separation between functionality and appearance. And one is modules, and one is themes. We also have what is called the Contrib repository. So when you download Drupal Core, it comes with this set of pre-built uh, modules and themes that you can use, but you can, as I said before, extend Drupal beyond that. So in the Drupal, in the Contrib repository, you will find more modules. For example, to integrate with Stripe, to integrate uh, 
with um, a JavaScript library that will create a, a map on your website. If you can find a theme that will allow you to have uh, you know responsive, better responsive support, for example. So and you can also find distributions. Distributions are pre-version of Drupal that are packaged toward a specific use case. For example, if you want to build a website for a church, there is a distribution called Open Church, and that has a lot of pre-built functionality for that. If you want to build for uh, e-commerce solution, you have Drupal Commerce. If you want to build for newspaper, you have Open Public. And you know, basic there are more than 200 use cases that are distributions available for. Um, and the idea with the contributed modules is that you can mix and match together to and combine them to build something specific. Let's say that you want to create an image carousel. Uh, you might have one module that, pro in, that integrates the library and another module that produces the listing of images that, is going, that are going to be in the slideshow. So uh, it, it is possible and actually very common to combine multiple modules to, to achieve a, a particular functionality. And now we go to content, which is like the main uh, purpose of Drupal in the end, managing content. So the first thing that we find is a node. What is a node? A node is a piece of information that can tell a story by itself. Uh, it serves as a container used to describe something. Let's say that we have a car. What can we say about a car? We can describe it the year, the make, the model, the type of fuel, uh, if it has windows, the number of windows, and so on. So basically, we can describe a car, and that description will live in a node inside Drupal. This is a, an example of a, a, a node in Drupal. A node can describe something tangible, like a car, or something non-tangible, like an article. So every node will have a title, uh, that's required. It will have uh, author, an author, and a publication date. It, it also has a URL. The, the URL can be one of two things. Internally, every node will have something that is called node ID, which is a number. It starts with one, and any time that you create a node, it increments by one, so the second one will be two, three, and, and so on. So you can access any node on Drupal by going to the domain, slash node, slash the node ID. But imagine that a newspaper, very famous newspaper, publish an article and they tell you, go to mynewspaper.com slash node slash 1500-521. By the time you get home, you might have forgotten the number. We as humans, it is easier for us to remember phrases than to remember a number. So in addition to being able to access the node by, by its node ID, you can also do it by what is called a path alias or URL alias, which is like a string, a phrase that you can remember, and in this case is slash blog, slash altering, dash views, dash results. So that's another property of a node. They have a node ID and optionally a URL alias. Nodes have other properties, well, for example, if they are published or non-published, um, and they have the, the ability to have fields, and we're going to talk f about fields in a moment, uh, but for now, just like Remember that fields is another way to store information. So in our website, we are able to store information about cars. But can we have more wheels? Can we have something else? Of course we can. Let's say that in this website, we want to store information about mon monocycles, bicycles, tricycles, and cars. In real life, these objects have different properties. For example, a, a motorcycle does have windows. And as far as I know, it can, they cannot go in reverse. So just like in real life, you use different like names or categories for certain type of objects, in Drupal, you do the same. If you want to categorize nodes, the like, first way to do it is using what is called content types. So a content type is an abstraction, something that allows you to group nodes that share similar characteristics or describe the same idea. So I, have a, I can have a content type for cars, I can have a content type for motorcycles, and so on. And the content type itself is going to serve as a template of the information that I'm going to collect. So for example, in the content type for cars, I might ask why, uh, how many windows there are. In the content type for 
event, I can ask when the event is happening. In the content type for blog, I can ha I can ask who is the uh, you know the sources for this article and so on. And in general, they is the collection and management of the information. For example, uh, for example, you can say I want to retrieve all the notes of type articles. I want to retrieve all the notes of type events. I want to retrieve all the notes of type uh, car and so on. One very important relationship and distinction between content types and articles is that one node can be of only one type. You cannot have node one belonging to the article content type and at the same time to the basic page content type. One node can only have uh, one uh, content type associated. On the, on, the other, on the other way, one article can have many <coughs> notes associated with, that, with them, and that is actually desired. You don't want to have one content type that only has you know, a handful of notes. It is possible, Drupal will not uh, complain about that, but for the site administrator, the more content types that you have, the more management you have to do. So you want to you know, think a little bit about how you organize your information so that you only have the content types that are really and truly required. But in, in this image, the, the numbers inside the blue circles represent the node ID. And if you scan the image, you will see that the node ID doesn't repeat uh, in, 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 in two different places, again, because they need to be unique in the system and they cannot belong to more than one uh, content type at the same time. So going back to the, to the idea of having multiple content types, let's say that we have a car dealership and you know a customer comes to the store and they are looking for something specific. Uh, maybe they don't want a motorcycle because they, don't, they cannot ride one. So they only want cars. I, I tell my Drupal website, bring all the cars, bring all the noise of the content type car. But what happens if this person is looking for a Toyota Yaris 2010 color red? Something particular. The content type by itself um, is not able to retrieve that particular element. So how can you do that? You do that using fields. And feel as powerful, flexible, awesome in general. So let's have a look at different characteristics of fields. Anyone here have ever used Facebook or Twitter? Have you? How easy or how hard it is to find something? Like if you go to a, you know, Walmart and you are looking for, I don't know, diet coke. How 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 easy is it to find something like that? Um, it might be complicated. And the fact is that. These websites allow you to have free text. In free text, you can put whatever you want. You can write a poem, you can write a product description, you can write a description of an event, and so on. And when you have free text, it, it becomes very hard to, to, to find information, uh, useful information down the road. So uh, in Drupal, we try to avoid that using fields. Uh, when you have the, the ability to enter content in any format that you want, you start getting inc inconsistent data. Uh, if you want to describe a date, you can fully spell the month, or you can use an abbreviation, or you can use a number, or you can, for the year, you can use four or two-digit format. For the separator, you can use a slash or a dash. Or if you are interacting with people from different backgrounds, or, many, or maybe you are serving different countries, the format of the date can change. In Nicaragua, for example, we put the day before the month, which is the other way around. So if, if, you, if you don't enforce some rules, or uh, something like this might happen, inconsistent data, and again, this becomes really hard to search. You can also get invalid data. How old are you? I am minus 10 years old. When is your birthday? February 31st. Like if you look at them piece by piece, February is a valid month, 31 is a possible value for a, a day, some time in the year, and 2000 also makes sense, but combine the three elements, it doesn't, it cannot be possible. In, in the case of the price, you have the US like currency symbol, but the, the currency itself, it says euros. For the email, you are missing the ad sign, and for the phone, it's not even a number, and it has a, like a happy face at the end. Again, in Bailey data is possible when you have free text, and this makes Drupal cry. So if you want to make Drupal unhappy, you allow free text, you allow inconsistent data, and you allow in data. So how can I make it a little bit happy? 
We use fields because fields allow you to enforce validation criteria. You can have a field for a number. Let's say, uh, what is the price for this event? So you can say the price for an event is something that I require to have. I cannot have a, an event that I don't know how much it costs. So for one, it is a required piece of data. You can also say that it, it will have a minimum value. It, the event might be free, but I will not be paying you to come to my event. So the minimum will be zero. The maximum, I don't put anything because, you know, if someone wants to pay a million dollars to come here, why not? For prefix, you can define a prefix and a suffix to make things um, clear of what we're talking about. Yes, it's, it's, it's a money value, but in which co co currency? So in this case, US dollars and not euros or yen or something else. Another thing is that when you have fields, they are of different types. So you can have a field for numbers and a field for images. And in the case of images, you can say um, what type of formats are supported, PNG, GIF, JPEG, uh, what is the minimum or the maximum resolutions that are supported, how big can be the image in, in terms of file size and so on. So using this, you, you can have a, a, at least a guarantee that something is happening on the criteria that you are defining. And no, this makes Drupal happier. And if you want to make Drupal love you, this is the recipe. For every piece of data that you want to create, you will create a new field. And you need to choose the right type of field. For example, earlier I was mentioning that you can describe a car by year, make, model, color, and so on. Each of these pieces of data is going to be its own field. So the year is a number field. The, the make, uh, it's a text, can be a text field. The, the photo of the vehicle itself is an image field, and, and so on. So each of these elements, it's going to become its own field. Another property that, uh, that you get when you allow fields is that it is possible to collect the same data in multiple ways. Imagine that you want to store the location of this event. Where is this happening? You can use a, like a fully spelled address. You can use latitude and longitude. Uh, you can put a marker and ask the user to click on the marker to locate the event. Or similar to you know PDF, Word documents, and so on, there are specific uh, file types that you can use to store geographical information. So you can put on the website like a file upload widget, allow this type of field, KML, and extract the geographical information from that field. So you know it's 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 the same thing being done in four different ways, and uh, and having fields allow you this flexibility. And something else is that. You can collect the information in one format and present it in a different format. You can collect an address and put it, um, uh, and when you present that information, put it on a, on a map. It doesn't, the input format doesn't have to be the same as the output format. And on top of that, you can, once all the information is collected on your website, you can aggregate it and combine it and have one unified display. For example, this is a real Drupal website called Drupical. It, uh, collects information of events happening all over the world about Drupal. And in, in this case, they have a content type for events. The content type has, has a field for title, has a field for type of event. This is a Drupal cam, a Drupal con, this is a meeting or, or something else. It collects the date and the location of the event. In this case, the markers is a combination of two different field informations. The address to put the pin on the map and the type of event to color code the pin. So you are combining two different, two different fields uh, in one display, in one uh, presentation. Another thing that fields can do, as I said before, you can have a content type with 10 fields, but to the end users, you only show eight. So you can, for each individual field, decide do I want to show it or do I want to hide it? So that's possible. This is an example uh, of many different fields. The title is a text field that, where it says established in 26, uh, 2006. That is actually a number field because years are numbers uh, that it happen to have a prefix. So by putting a number field, I can establish like some validation criteria like I don't want to store information about organizations that are uh, were established before 2000, for example. So having the field in as a number in this case, 
will allow you to have that, that type of validation. <laughs> you can also have multi-line text fields, images, URLs, emails, numbers like telephone numbers, categories, uh, dates, times, and so on. There are many types of fields. A lot come with Drupal core out of the box. Some of them come with Drupal core, but they are disabled out of the box. Because again, like Drupal can be used for so many things, and we want to make the less number of assumptions as possible. If you don't want, if you don't need telephone numbers in your Drupal site, you don't enable that module. If you don't need emails in your Drupal site, you don't enable that module. And, and they are very specific in that regard. So, and for some of them, you need to go to Contrib and start adding them. For example, Drupal Core doesn't provide one module to store address information, but in the Contrib repository, there is one. So you just like go, get it, install it, and, and that's it. You get the functionality. So as a summary of what fields are, fields allow you to structure the information that you're going to store. Um, they say you know each piece of data in a discrete way, and they can be used for displaying, filtering, sorting um, information. So going back to you know the page, what we have talked about nodes, content types, and fields. So this is going to be, let's say, the center of the page. The center of the page is one node that belongs to one particular content type and that has you know, many fields. The title, the, the tagline, the, the body of the text itself, the image that is being shown there, and so on. So, so far we have talked about the center of the website. What about the rest? Anything else around the center is a block. So a blog is a container for extra information uh, that is going to be displayed al, you know, on the website. A blog will be placed in something that is called a theme region. So what is a theme region? When you install Drupal out of the box, it's called, it comes with a theme called Bartik, which is kind of blue. And each theme is going to be different. But in this particular case, Bartik defines a lot of, let's say, boxes that you can place content inside of them. Um, in this case, they are, they are color-coded in, in yellow. So anywhere where you see a yellow rectangle, you can put something in there. If you install Drupal, vanilla Drupal, you might notice that contrary to what is on the screen, you don't see a, a gray uh, stripe that in this example says feature top. And the reason you don't see that is because there is no content in that region. And if there is no content in that region, the theme can decide you know, to hide it completely. And in this case, when you hide the whole thing, you don't see the, the, the gray stripe there. If you were to put something in there, you, you will get it. Uh, that uh, idea of hiding uh, a region, the, the technical term is, is collapsing. So the, the region is collapsed altogether. The same happens with the sidebars. If you don't have content in any of the sidebar, the theme can decide to collapse it so that the main content expand to use the empty space. And that is very likely a good thing. And having so many regions, it is, again, it's the, it is the responsibility of the theme to decide do I want to collapse something or not. For example, in the footer, we see that there are four columns in the, in the black background. Those regions do not collapse out of the box. So if you place some content in, in one of them and the other ones are empty, you, you will still only be using 25% of, of the full width of the website uh, for that particular content. And again, this, these are called theme regions. And go, going back to blocks, blocks can display static or dynamic information. Let's say the footer, you know, the copyright 2019 at the bottom of your website, or the sponsor of an event that is going to appear any time that, the, that a page is displayed, that is a static content. And you can use blocks to display static content, or you can use blocks to display dynamic content. Let's say that you have a blog on the sidebar with the latest articles in your blog, or you have a blog, a, a blog on the sidebar with the latest uh, products that have arrived to your store. If you write a new article every day, if you get a new product every week, that is going to be changing automatically without you having to do anything. Uh, so th those are cases of dynamic or static content. Blogs can also enforce visibility rules. For example, I want the more articles written by the same person blog, 
only available when I am seeing a node of type article. Because if I am seeing a node of type event, it doesn't make sense to see more articles written by the same event. That doesn't make any sense. So you can create a configure blocks so that they only appear when certain conditions are met. You can use content types, you can use pages, uh, and in this case, page means URL, like something that only appears on the front page, something that only appears on the contact page, something that only appears in the uh, human resources section of my website, and so on. And uh, you can also do it by language, like if you say it's multilingual, I only want this to appear in the Spanish, English, French version of the website. And you can also do it by roles, which we're going to cover a little bit later. Blogs can be aware of, of the environment in which they are displayed. Again, when you have more articles by the same author, before the, the blog itself is displayed, it will check the whole page. Okay, this is a node of type um, article that was created by the user Mauricio. So I'm going to look in the database for more articles written by Mauricio and I'm going to show those those articles. If now I am seeing another article written by Michelle, okay, let's have a look. What other articles are written by Michelle? So the same blog, the same list in the same formatting is going to change depending on who wrote the article. And in that in that sense, you can read information from your environment to change what is going to be displayed to, at, in the very end. And similar to content types, and that content types can have fields, the blocks themselves can have fields. So everything that I mentioned before about fields, it's also applicable for blocks. And let's say that you have a special offer block with a title, a description, an image, and an expiration date. And as long as that expiration date hasn't arrived, you are always be going to show, you are always going to show this block on the sidebar. So that's a, 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 a use case for a blog that has many fields. Another concept that is very useful is views. Views is a very big concept. We can have like a full day training on views and probably not cover everything that it has to offer. So I'm just going to resume in two slides. So bear with me. In general, a view is listing of information. Anything that you have in store in your website, um, notes, users, comments, files, images, anything. It can be show as a list using a view. Um, the view uh, works in, like in a two-step process. First, it is going to scan all your website based on the criteria that you define. Let's say I want articles uh, written from January 1st, 2019 onwards. So f the first part of the view is looking for the content. Once the content is retrieved, the second part of the view is how I'm going to show the content. Do I want to show an HTML table? Do I want to show an RSS feed? Do I want to create a PDF document or a CVS document with that information? So the view can be used to create many type of display, a map, an image slideshow, a JSON file, and so on. So the same information that was retrieved in the first step can be presented in more than one way uh, in the second step. This is an example of a view in Drupal. The table that we see there uh, is collecting information from nodes. One thing to notice that in the first column we have uh, the plate, the year, the make, and the model. And even though they are shown in one column, internally they are four different fields. When I created the view, I configured the view to combine those fields together into one column. But internally they are separate. We also have a, a column for images. I noticed that the images for the most part have the same presentation, the same format. That is something that is called image styles, and Drupal is able to automatically pre-process all your images so they have a consistent appearance. You can crop, you can grayscale, you can watermark, you can do that automatically. On this example you have on the screen, can you highlight uh, what is the view and, and then what are the components inside of it? So, the question is, in this example, what is the view? The view uh, is the table and the things that are on top of that. So, so I'm going to go to go to that. The table itself is the main connector of the view. The cars, or it says cars, is the title of the view. And the like widgets that we have below, where it says year, make, model, sort by descending, that is what is called 
uh, filter, exposed filters. So that is something that views can have as well. And the idea is that when you create a view, it will have a default presentation, but you might want your end users, give your end users the flexibility to look for something specific, to drill down for something. So let's say I want year 2010, May Toyota model Yaris. So when you, when you have an exposed filter, you give that flexibility to the user, and when they search, the table itself is going to update and you know only show the elements that uh, that you know match the criteria that was set before. So in this case, the view is basically everything on the right, from cars to the exposed widgets to the table itself. So everything is is the view. Uh, and and this is another part that I want to highlight. Remember that. We talked about notes before. Notes uh, take up the main part of the website, of, of, a, of a web page when you display it. In the case of a view, they can also take the, the main part, the, the biggest part of the, of the page when it is being displayed. But in this particular uh, screenshot, we actually have two views. On the top left, we have a small like box that says random car and has a photo. That is also a view. So in one single page, you can have more than one view, you can have more than one blog, you can have more than one note, and so on. So in this case, uh, remember that I said views are for listing of content, and when you think of listing, it might be two or more usually. But there are some scenarios when having a list of one makes sense. In this case, it is a list of one random element, but you can have the most visited article, you can have the most purchased item on the store, and so on. So you, when you want to have something random, or the best of, the most of, you can create a view of one element, and have that element being displayed th that way. So, as I said before, views are super flexible. In this case, everything, uh, you know, the title cards, the widget, and the, and the table is one view. The, the block on the top left is a different view. So you get flexibility in that regard. Um, and wh why so much theory? Why do we need to understand all of this? Because Drupal love nest, nesting information, nest, nesting concepts, and so on. So if you are a front-end developer, a themer, you might look at the markup of the website and you see that to print one line, you have like many layers of divs and markup hierarchy there. If you are a developer, you might notice that there are a lot of data structures that have very, very deep, uh, you know, levels of hierarchy. But also, Drupal loves to nest concepts. So this is probably the most important slide of the whole presentation. Let's say that we have more articles by the same author on the sidebar. In order to produce that piece of information, you are going to interact with at least five different concepts that we talked already. In order to show, in order for something to appear on the website, they need to be in a theme region. So in this case, the sidebar. So that's the first concept. What do we show in sidebars? We show blocks. So that's your second concept. Then this block is a listing of information, a list of notes, which was created using a view. Now I am showing information about the notes themselves. And for each of the nodes, I'm going to show a specific fields, the title, the year, the author, the image, and so on. So it's one piece of content, but you are interacting with five different uh, ideas in Drupal. And it is important to understand what are you dealing with, because if you want to make any change, you need to understand, oh, do I need to go to change something in the theme region? Do I need to change something in the view? Do I need to change something in the node, and so on? So. Imagine that a Drupal page can have so many things. In, in real life, you know, so one page can be the result of a hundred of this combination of you know, blog, themes, users, and so on. And these pieces can like be swapped around. For example, you can have a, a, a blog on the sidebar that instead of showing notes, you show users, for example. Or you might have a blog that has nothing to do with views nodes or fields, so in that case you only interact with two elements, the theme region and the blog. The, the, the idea is that if you know the building blocks, if you know how each concept relate to each other, how they build on top of each other, you will be able to mix and match them however you want. And if you know what you're dealing with, uh, 
It's important because on the administration side of things, there are specific pages to administer nodes, to administer views, to administer uh, users, and so on. So having that understanding is very important to know how to make changes to the Drupal website so that you get the results that you expect. So going back to this image, again, the center of the image can be a node or it can be a view and everything around is a blog. And the blogs, again, can show information from users, from nodes, from fields. You can combine them. They belong to a theme region, and so on. So as an exercise, you can try to map either this uh, screenshot or your own website, trying to figure out what are the different elements in the different concepts that we have described so far. Again, um, each of these concepts is going to have one specific uh, administration screen on the Drupal website. Let's have a look at other things. Users. <coughs> what is a user? A user is a visitor to my website. Anyone who visits is a, uh, is a user. Uh, again, Drupal allows multiple people to participate in the creation of content or in the consumption of that content. And the permissions and the access that each, of each user will have will depend on, on, on a couple of things. Um, similar to notes, users can have a name, can have an email address, they can have a photo, they can have a description, and they can have a language. So if, you, if your site is multi, multilingual, the user can define, I want to see that site in blue, excuse me, in Spanish, in English, or French. The user can also have a time zone associated with them. So if your website is, you know, serves a very wide area or different countries and you have events, those events are going to be translated automatically to the time zone of the user as they were specified in their profile. Users have also like the uh, an, uh, a UID, which is similar to the NID, like user ID and not ID are similar concepts. They behave similarly. They can also have uh, URL aliases, because if you don't remember the number, you can remember the alias of the user. Users can also have fields. So again, in Drupal, we reuse the same ideas over and over. And content types can have fields. Um, blogs can have fields. Users can also have fields. And when you have a user, that user is going to, to have associated with them a, a set of roles. So a role is a collection of permissions. For example, uh, by default, Drupal comes with three permissions, the anonymous user, which is like uh, anyone who comes to the website and doesn't have a username and a password. An authenticated user is like when you create an account on the website, when the user authenticates, they get this role automatically. And then the administrator, who is able to do anything on the website, including taking it down. So you need to be very mindful and careful who is assigned this role because they can do basically anything. But in addition to this, you can create more roles like editors with a limited set of permissions. Uh, again, Drupal will not impose a restriction on how many roles you can have, uh, but try to keep the number low because the more roles that you have, the more things you need to manage. Um, one way to organize roles is like by, you know, like similar to the hierarchy of your organization, if that's something that you have, or the different type of things that can be done, or the different type of access that need to be granted per section, like one role for to access the human resources section of my website, one for accounting, one for sales, and so on. So you can create them however you want. The important thing is that a role is a collection of permissions. And what is a permission anyway? A permission is a check, a yes or no question. Uh, is this person able to create content of type article? Can they revert revisions of, of those notes? Can they post comments? They, can they uh, use that sideways contact form? And so on. So it's a yes or no to these specific questions. And by, the, by default, Drupal comes with about 100 permissions. And the more modules that you install, the more permissions that you have. So that's what I said. Be mindful of how many roles you have because you will have, if you have 100 permissions and five roles, you will need to check uh, 500 things like the combination of roles and permissions, how do I assign yes or no to each of them? 
And this is how the, all the pieces fit, uh, fit together. If you want to say Mauricio, I want to give Mauricio access to post content on my website. The, the posting content is one permission, and Mauricio is a user. But you cannot go directly from that permission to the user. You need to assign one or more permissions to a role, and then assign the role to the user. And that's how the user gets access to whatever was defined at the permission level. A user can have more than one role associated with them, and the permission is going to be the sum of all the permissions that have been collected in those roles. So that's how they works. Menus, menus are a collection of, yes? Oh, with the roles, if you've got two different roles and they conflict in permission, oh, which one uh, you? So the question is, if you have roles and they conflict in permissions, remember that um, uh, a role is just a collection of permissions. So in the end, it's just like a sum of them. Um, for example, if when you say collide, do you mean that they have the same permission on both of them? Oh, one says, yes, you have access, and one says, you don't. So, uh, by collision, if, if one says you have access and one says you don't have access, Drupal, in, in this case, having access wins. So, if one says that you have access and the other one says you don't have access, because one of those gave you access already, like the end user will have access to the thing. Usually, uh, it's a yes no question, and it is no by default. As soon as you say yes to any of them, you get the permission, and when you get the permission, it doesn't matter if in a different role you were not granted, you, you know, as long as one of the roles grants that permission to you, you will have that in the end. So it's like, in this case, the yes is going to win. And if you have the same permission on two or more roles, it doesn't matter, it's going to, you know, pick individual, uh, like, unique elements of the whole set. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect the behavior. So menus, menus are collection of links that are used to navigate the website. Menus can be hierarchical. For example, uh, this, uh, in the top, we have home services, blogs, about and contact. That's a menu. Um, it's very simple, one level. But again, you can go crazy and do hierarchies and start putting videos in your menus and articles in your menus. I highly not recommend doing that. It gets complicated, but it's possible. But in the end, menus are just like a way to allow users to navigate your website. Taxonomy is another concept that might be confusing at the beginning. In general, taxonomy is used for categorizing of information, connecting, relating, classifying information. And to understand the whole system, there are only two things that you need to be aware of, vocabularies and terms. So what are they? A vocabulary is a container of taxonomy terms. Similarly to a content type is a container for notes, a vocabulary uh, is a container for taxonomy terms. And the vocabulary, vocabulary itself is just a name, in this case fruits. My vocabulary is fruits and they make taxonomy terms are the individual elements, apple, strawberry, orange and grapes. Similar to what, you know, users, blogs, notes, vocabularies can also have fields. So I added an image field to this vocabulary so that every term, in addition to having the name, I can also attach a photo of the term itself. So in this case, apple and the photo of the apple. Um, vocabularies can be hierarchical, so you can have you know, different levels of, of nesting. Uh, this is you know, human life or life classification. We're supposed to be animals in the animal kingdom, in the cordata phylum, in the mammalia class, and like 17 level deeps, we are almost sapiens sapiens or something like that. So you can have vocabularies to have this hierarchy. Uh, in the case of cars, for example, you can have a vocabulary that the first hierarchy is the make, and the second hierarchy is the, the second level is the model, like Toyota and then Yaris. There are uh, some real life uses for this, you know, for pet categorization, you can, you can have a vocabulary with all these possibilities. And other use cases, you can use taxonomy terms to tag your content, and that will, by default, create a, a specific page on Drupal that will show all the nodes that were tagged with that specific uh, you know, taxonomy term. 
You can also use the taxonomy term to show more articles that have that same taxonomy term, so to relate content. Uh, that is provided by a module called similar by terms. You can also use your uh, taxonomy vocabulary to assign permissions on the website. There is a module called Workbench Accents that depending on, it, it associates a user with a taxonomy term. And depending on that relationship, you will have access to some part of the website. So again, you can have a taxonomy vocabulary that has taxonomy terms that represent the hierarchy of your organization and assign one term to the user. And with that, grant or deny access to the to different parts of, of my website to those users. Uh, because vocabularies can have fields, you can uh, you know you can create an address field, for example, and attach geographical information. So that when you say I tag this event as happening in Boston or New York or Cambridge or um, Berkeley or San Francisco, when you show a map of those elements, you can extract the, the geographical data to locate the pin on the marker. So you can. Again, anything that we have said before can be combined however you want or however you need for displaying purposes. Again, users, taxonomy terms, they combine in so many ways. Some FAQ, um, there is a saying in Drupal that every time that you have got core, God kills a kitten. In this case, hacking means modifying the code that you download. Let's say that you want to make a very, very tiny change that is considered hacking core. And why is this a bad practice? Because Drupal, as I said before, is constantly evolving and new releases for either for security or for new features are made available. If you modify the code that you downloaded, the, the next time that a new release is available, the, the way to apply the new release is to override the old one. So you will be overriding your changes and maybe the change uh, Something changing the API internally, and the modification that you did before no longer applies. Or maybe you did a hundred modifications and you forgot to make the last one when the new uh, uh, version was available. So that's a bad practice. So if you want to make changes to how Drupal behaves, the way to do it is not hacking core, it's not modifying the files that you download. Um, the way is creating modules. So through modules, you can hook into the API that Drupal offers, and this in this uh, video recording, you can learn more about that. If you need to modify the presentation of the website, you can use Tweak, and this is a recording of a session that I have presented before about uh, how to modify the visual presentation of Drupal. And in general, I highly recommend to get involved with the community. Sometimes, you know, I spend hours trying to solve a problem, and then I meet someone, hey, do you know how to do this? In only five minutes, I have an answer. So being at that camp is a great start, but I encourage to come uh, more often, like the San Francisco, Berkeley community is very big. You have a lot of meetings happening monthly that you can attend, you can connect with people. And I think that one of the biggest benefits of Drupal is not the coding itself, it's the community around that, and how we are willing to help each other. So. Be part of something bigger than yourself, and thank you very much for being here. And that's my information. I will like the slides are available there. If you would like to provide anonymous feedback, you can fill out that five question survey, my Twitter handle, and my email account. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes. Workflows, you didn't talk about those specifically. What would be the best place to go to get a sense of what workflows are? So. Uh, by the question is uh, more about workflows. Where do I need? Where can I learn more about them? So workflows are part of Drupal core, and they come uh, out of the box. The difference or the caveat is that they do not come enabled out of the box. So you need to go to the administration screen and enable the modules that relate to them. But workflow is basically kind of a list of states over which the uh, your content can go through, from draft to reviewed by the content editor to review by the uh, department chief to publish. So the, it's just like a sequential list of steps. And the way that you configure them is like, OK, if a piece of content is in this state, 
what are the possible transitions so it can go to that or it can go to that one, like go go forward in the in the in the pipeline, or go backwards. So, so you're talking about a sequence there, it, right? Yes. Okay, sequence, and then permissions are probably attached to it as well. Uh, permission is a, a little bit of a separate concept. The way that permissions attach to 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 workflows and state is that you can assign who has permission to move to the next state or to the previous state. So, like to try to put it together. Workflow is just like a list of states and a list of transitions from one to other. So that is like the main concept of workflows. The way that permissions tie into this is that depending on your permissions, you can see content in this state and you can change the state to one or another. So that's how it, it like goes together. There are, I would recommend to look in the, the official documentation on Drupal.org or go to Drupal.tv or YouTube in general, these sessions are being recorded and I'm pretty sure sometime, somewhere, have given a presentation on that particular topic. So Drupal.tv is like a repository of video recordings. This session is going to be there probably tomorrow. So just like use the search bar and say, you know, workflows in Drupal and it's very likely something will come up. Any other question? Oh, thank you very much.